Hello and welcome to this basics episode on the Liverpool and Manchester Railway. An in-depth look at aspects of the early days of steam. The Liverpool and Manchester Railway is 190 years old this month. It was the first mainline railway and marked the beginning of the modern railway as we know it. Like so many other railway schemes before it, the Liverpool and Manchester Railway grew out of dissatisfaction with existing forms of transport. The roads were rutted, journeys were slow and the tolls on the turnpikes were high. The canals were slow and very expensive and it could take anything up to two weeks for goods to travel from Liverpool to Manchester. The first idea for a railway between the two towns had been made as early as 1814. William James, a civil engineer, had carried out his first survey for a horse-drawn railway in 1822. The railway was not a new idea, of course, the earliest railways in England being technology imported from the Austrian Tyrol during the Elizabethan era, when immigrant miners established silver mines in the Lake District. Hitherto, however, railways had been largely unidirectional in terms of traffic flow, taking coal or quarried rock down to a canal, river or sea wharf for onward transport. There was very little or no traffic coming the other way. The Liverpool and Manchester Railway, however, was different because it envisaged a two-way flow of traffic, of goods, raw materials and people between the two towns. The company was founded by Joseph Sanders, a wealthy Liverpool corn merchant, and John Kennedy, the owner of the largest cotton spinning mill in Manchester. The main moving force behind the project, and who would later serve as secretary, treasurer and general manager, was Henry Booth, another Liverpool corn merchant. And it was Booth, of course, who would design the boiler for Rocket. It is interesting to note that all three of them were Unitarians, and were active in left-wing radical politics, with Sanders and Booth having both been members of the Liverpool Jacobin Club, an organisation which wholeheartedly supported the ideas of liberté, égalité et fraternité of the French Revolution and wished to spread them in this country. In order to build their railway, they would require an Act of Parliament. A route was surveyed by George Stevenson, who was then the most well-known locomotive and railway engineer in the country. George was then at work on the Stockton and Darlington Railway. A bill was introduced in Parliament in 1824, but it was thrown out in 1825 due to fierce opposition from the landed gentry, but also due to errors in the survey and George's terrible performance before a parliamentary committee. Some of the London establishment thought him a foreigner due to his thick Geordie accent, whilst others thought him insane. His plan to cross the huge swampy area near Manchester called Chat Moss was openly ridiculed. Suffice to say, George was moved on from his position as engineer and replaced by John and George Rennie and Charles Black of Vignoles, all very much part of the London establishment and very much the right sort of people to appeal to Parliament and to the House of Lords. A second bill was introduced and on the 5th of May 1826 it became law. The railway was born. It took four back-breaking years to build the railway at a cost of over a million pounds. Or in today's money that's 68 million pounds sterling. Work started in June 1826 at Chat Moss where thousands of tons of earth and stones were dumped into the marsh, interleaved with woven hurdles of brushwood. Drainage ditches were dug, lined with wooden barrels to carry off the water. But slowly and surely, the four and three quarter mile stretch of line across the marsh was made, and the first train ran across it, headed quite aptly by the rocket, on New Year's Day, 1830. Other major engineering obstacles were the crossing of the Sankey Valley. Recognising George Stevenson's lack of experience in building bridges, the board appointed Jesse Hartley, a Yorkshireman from Pontefract and also a Unitarian, as its civil engineer, and he designed and supervised the thirty-odd bridges on the line. The Sankey Viaduct was originally intended to have been built from stone, 
but due to the soft ground it was built on, it was instead built from brick with stone faces. Each of the nine piers is supported on hundreds of wooden piles driven into the soft ground beneath it to hold it up. Crossing the River Irwell into Manchester was another problem. The local landowner, Miss Eleanor Byram, had refused to allow locomotive to work over her land, and it took a lot of back and forth between the railway and her solicitors as late as September 1830 to get permission to run steam locomotives over the river into Manchester, and indeed preparations had been made, in event of permission not being gained, to stop trains on the Liverpool side of the River Irwell. During construction of the Irwell Bridge, the Coffer Dam midstream kept leaking, and on one stormy day, a ferry boat carrying a dozen men to the worksite capsized and many of them drowned. Work on Liverpool Road Station in Manchester was curtailed for a while due to a strike by the itinerant brickmakers and the bricklayers, and by the collapse of one of the arches of the viaduct. Liverpool Road Station is now the world's oldest surviving purpose-built railway station, and is home to the Science and Industry Museum in Manchester. It closed to passengers way back in 1844, when Manchester Victoria opened, but continued as a goods depot until the 1970s, when it was rescued by a group of volunteers, the Liverpool Road Station Society, who recognised its historic significance. Perhaps the second biggest challenge after Chat Moss was at the Liverpool end, the driving of the tunnel down to the docks at Wapping. But there was a problem when it was found an error in the survey meant that the different sections of the tunnel were not in alignment by as much as 13 feet and in fact could have missed each other. This was used as a justifiable excuse to dismiss the Rennies and replace them with George Stevenson. After all, he was the man the board had always wanted. The Wapping Tunnel is over a mile long and falls on an average gradient of 1 in 95, but at its steepest is 1 in 48. It's double track, and thanks to Liverpool Town Fathers prohibiting the use of locomotives within the town limits, was worked by stationary engines and endless ropes. A pair of 50 horsepower winding engines were supplied by Robert Stevenson and Company, and were housed in John Foster's fabulous Moorish Arch, sadly long since demolished. Steam was supplied by a battery of eight Cornish boilers, the boiler houses being hewn from solid rock in the Edge Hill cutting. The first Liverpool passenger terminus at Crown Street, now demolished, was also worked by stationary engines. So too Lime Street Station, which opened in 1836, and this too was worked by stationary engines and ropes until the 1870s. It was one thing to have built a railway, but it was another thing entirely how it was to be worked and operated. The earliest public railway, that is one open to all users upon payment of a specified toll, as opposed to private colliery railways, was the Lake Lock Railroad of 1796 in Yorkshire. That was also the first instance of a company with capital held in shares being established to build and operate a railway. So the Liverpool wasn't new in either regard, but where it was new was in owning all the track, buildings, infrastructure, locomotives and carriages, and running its own trains. The earlier Stockton and Darlington had outsourced the operation of its trains and even maintenance of the track to third-party contractors, rather like the fragmented privatised system in Britain today. But it was the Liverpool and Manchester which set the mould for all public railways in Britain which were to follow until the privatisation of the network in the 1990s. The steam locomotive was not new. Richard Trevithick had demonstrated his first locomotive in South Wales in 1804, and the Middleton Railway in Leeds had been using steam commercially from 1812, and indeed the Middleton locomotives were still at work in the 1830s. The idea of a passenger railway wasn't new either, as the Swansea and Mumbles Railway of 1804 had carried passengers and worked to a timetable from 1807. But despite all this prior knowledge, the board of directors were divided in their opinion in terms of motive power. George and Robert Stevenson and Henry Booth were all in favour of locomotives. However, a cabal of Quaker directors, led by James Cropper, were not only opposed to the Stevensons, but also to locomotives. They believed that with George Stevenson as chief engineer, and Robert Stevenson supplying the locomotives, that the Stevensons would have an unfair monopoly on the line. The Croppers and their allies believed the line would be better worked by horses, after all horses didn't have a tendency to explode 
or by ropes and stationary engines. Despite seeking the expert advice of many of the leading railway authorities in the countries, and sending John Rastrick of Starbridge and James Walker of London on a tour of all the working railways in the north of England to ascertain the benefits of locomotives versus stationary engines, they still could not decide. So in April 1829, the board of directors offered a premium of £500 or £34,000 in 2020 money for the most improved railway locomotive to compare in a series of trials against stationary engines. As a result, the Rainhill trials were held in October 1829 at Rainhill, the only level straight section of the line. There were three series contenders, Rocket by George and Robert Stevenson and Henry Booth, saint Pareil by Timothy Hackworth and The Novelty by John Braithwaite and John Erickson of London. But as history records, Rocket was the winner and was the first locomotive in history to run continuously for 70 miles, representing an out and back journey from Liverpool to Manchester. It was game set and matched the Stevensons and took the locomotive. It had originally been intended to lay the Liverpool and Manchester with four lines of track, so as to segregate traffic heading to and from Liverpool and also its speed, so that in modern parlance there was a fast and slow up and a fast and slow down. In the event it was built as a double track with an up and down line, but with refuge sidings to allow faster trains to overtake the slower one. This was a major revolution in how railways were built and operated. Earlier lines had been only single track with passing places, with traffic operating on the single line in two directions, and this often led to confusion, delay and accidents. It was also not conducive to running a high speed passenger and goods service. The Liverpool and Manchester, however, despite many suggestions to the contrary, did not originate the British standard gauge of 4 feet 8.5 inches or 1,435 millimetres, as it was laid at a gauge of 4 feet 8, so technically it was built as a narrow gauge line. It was also the first fully signalled railway, with constables posted every mile with flags and hand lamps in order to control the trains. They showed a red flag for stop or danger, white for all clear and green for caution. Passenger and goods trains were both worked to a timetable. Passenger timetables were not new in 1830, but due to the heavy traffic on the line, a working timetable was instituted from the beginning, so that there was a minimal interval of half an hour between every train, and the drivers of passenger and goods trains were expected to stick rigidly to the speed limit to maintain this time interval. It was also the third railway to be worked entirely mechanically, George Stevenson's Hetton Railway of 1822 was to be the first worked without recourse to animal power, using stationary engines and locomotives. The second was the Canterbury and Whitstable, opened in 1830. The earliest Stockton and Darlington of 1825, however, used a combination of horses, locomotives and stationary engines for traction purposes. The entrance to Liverpool notwithstanding, the Liverpool and Manchester was worked exclusively by locomotives, and was the first to induce a wholly locomotive worked passenger and goods service. The Stockton and Darlington had used locomotives and horses to pull its coal trains, whilst passenger trains until 1833 would be worked by horses. In fact, the first railway to be completely locomotive worked was the Leeds and Selby Railway, opened in September 1834, and we'll look at that in another video. The Liverpool and Manchester Railway was formally opened on the 15th of September 1830 by the Duke of Wellington, the then Prime Minister. But it was a day which quickly turned sour after William Hoskisson, the Tory MP for Liverpool, was run over and mortally wounded at Parkside. The first public passenger train on the Liverpool and Manchester, and indeed the first ever charter train, was run on the following day, the 16th, when 150 Quakers chartered a train from Liverpool to Manchester and back, the journey taking an hour and 45 minutes. Public passenger service proper commenced on the 17th of September, and within a fortnight, the railway was carrying 760 passengers per day. Goods carrying in a limited capacity began in November, so too the carriage of mail for the first time by the railway. A goods service proper began in early 1831. The Liverpool and Manchester had a 15-year independent existence. In summer 1845, it was amalgamated with the Grand Junction Railway, 
with whom it had a close working relationship since it opened in 1837, and indeed shared many directors and financiers with it. In 1846, it was one of the constituents of the London and North Western Railway, at one time Britain's biggest joint stock company, and quite rightly referred to as the Premier Line. In 2020, the Liverpool and Manchester route, now known as the Chat Moss route, is still a key part of Britain's railway network. It was electrified in 2015, and in 2019 saw 200,000 passenger journeys to or from Manchester city centre each day. So those are the basics on the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, the first modern mainline railway, both in terms of concept and operation. If you'd like to find out more about the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, you can check out my various books, and you should also make contact with the Liverpool and Manchester Railway Trust, a non-profit organisation set up to promote the history, study and preservation of the first mainline railway. And finally, if you have enjoyed this video, please like, share, and if you haven't already, please subscribe.